Um, uh, my name is Brett, and thank you for all for coming, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, so I'm going to briefly describe our efforts to make uh, a workflow for identifying copy number variants from whole genome sequencing data. So I'll start with a, bit of, uh, a little bit of background and motivation for why we're doing what we're doing. So why do we want to find genetic variants in general? Well, the obvious answer is that many diseases have a strong genetic basis, and by looking for genetic variants, it makes it easier, um, or that's um, a common strategy for uh, understanding the genetics of these diseases. Uh, but more specifically, at TCAG, uh, for the last few years, we've been interested uh, specifically in autism. Uh, we're part of a study uh, that's called Missing. It's in collaboration with uh, Google as well as Autism Speaks, which is a charity. And its goal is to sequence the genomes of over 10,000 individuals from families that are affected by autism. So uh, right now we're at about five or 6,000 genomes, and our goal is to get to 10,000. So autism is a disorder uh, that's known to have a strong genetic basis. And the most straightforward evidence uh, for this, uh, for the genetic aspect, of autism is through twin studies. So if you have uh, identical twins, if one of the twins has autism, then about 90% of the time, the other tw twin will have autism as well. Uh, but for frat fraternal twins, uh, the numbers are quite different. If one twin has autism, then uh, the other twin will have autism only about 30% of the time. So this makes it quite clear that autism, that there's a strong genetic basis for autism, uh, but in terms of actually identifying uh, genes or other genomic regions that are associated with autism or that are risk factors for autism, this is actually a very difficult problem. Uh, so there have been a number of autism risk genes that have been identified so far, uh, but of the ones that we found so far, uh, there aren't any uh, that account for more than 1% of the cases with autism. So autism is a very complex genetic disease, and we need to be able to accurately identify genetic variants in order to better characterize the genetic basis of autism. So there are many different kinds of genetic variants. So there's single nucleotide variants, which is just a substitution of one, um, one nucleotide for another, and other kinds. But the, ones, uh, the kind of variant that we're interested in uh, in this talk is copy number variants. So copy number variants include uh, both deletions and duplications, and they're usually defined uh, as those that are more than 1,000 base pairs in length. So a deletion uh, is where in your sample you have a segment of DNA that's missing compared to the human reference genome, and a duplication is where you have um, uh, a duplicated segment of DNA in your sample relative to the human reference genome. So it's of interest to be, to, to be able to detect uh, copy number variants, or CNVs. So for the past uh, quite a few uh, years, the standard method for doing this uh, was microarrays. So both single nucleotide polymorphism microarrays, uh, despite their name, uh, and comparative genomic hybridization microarrays can both be used to detect uh, copy number variants. Uh, but more recently, uh, with the cost of whole genome sequencing going down, uh, it's becoming more and more attractive as an option for detecting CNVs. And this is because uh, whole genome sequencing has a number of advantages over microarrays in terms of detecting CNVs. Uh, for one, it covers the entire genome. So whereas microarrays only cover parts of the genome that are of interest, it doesn't cover the entire genome. Uh, whole genome sequencing, obviously by its name, uh, covers the entire genome. It also has better resolution. So theoretically, you can detect CNVs uh, with base pair resolution. You're not just finding a CNV at an approximate uh, genomic location. And whole genome sequencing, theoretically at least, is also better at detecting all uh, sizes of CNVs. So we want to move towards whole genome sequencing for detecting CNVs. But the question is, how exactly do we do this? So for other types of variants, uh, specifically single nucleotide variants and indels, uh, there's a sort of a standard pipeline that's very popular and pretty much everybody uses. And this pipeline involves uh, taking their reads, mapping them to the reference genome using BWA, and then running it through the Genome Analysis Toolkit, or GATK, to identify variants. So this is very common. It's pretty much the standard method for detecting uh, single nucleotide variants in indels. Uh, but for CNVs, it's actually a completely different story. So uh, this chart shows uh, about 50 methods that have been described for detecting CNVs um, and also structural variants, which are similar to CNVs. 
uh, from whole genome sequencing data. And the, the actual data in the graph shows you the percentage of citations for each method according to Google Scholar uh, relative to the total number of citations for all of these methods. Uh, so what this is designed to show is that there's no standard method uh, in terms of an algorithm for detecting CMVs from whole genome sequencing data. Um, if you look at uh, papers that have analyzed um, large cohorts, um, they, there's no standard method that's used um, even a large majority of the time. Uh, so I've classified these methods here as either being uh, based on read depth or based on paired end mapping or split reads. Uh, so in this study, we're focusing on methods that use read depth as their strategy for detecting CMVs from whole genome sequencing data. Uh, so uh, you probably got uh, the uh, idea from Lisa's talk as to what uh, read depth is, but basically the idea behind <coughs> read depth based methods is that they look at differences in the read depth in different genomic regions compared to the overall average. So if you have a genome that has an average sequencing depth of 30x, but you have a region in there uh, that only has an average of, say, 15x depth, then that suggests that there's a heterozygous deletion in that region. And similarly, if you have a region that has 45x depth, then that suggests that there's a duplication um, in that same region. So basically, the question is, how do you detect CNVs from whole genome sequencing data? It's, there's no clear standard method right now for doing that. So uh, just to be clear on what our goal is um, for the work we've been doing, our goal is not to develop a new and improved CMV detection method. So there's 50 methods already out there. We, don't, we didn't think that it made sense to develop the 51st method, uh, which is probably no better than whatever the best of the 50 method is. Uh, rather, our goal is to develop best practices for the use of existing methods. And when I say best practices, I'm talking not only about choosing which algorithm tends to be the most accurate, but also trying to, to come up with best practices for other stages of the whole pipeline that you're using to detect CNVs. So this includes DNA library preparation, sequencing, so what depth do you sequence at, um, what kind of filtering you, do you do for uh, regions of the genome that are repetitive or low complexity, things like that that'll, uh, that we can sort of suggest, best, our, our goal is to suggest best practices uh, for trying to, um, uh, be able to mo most act or detect CNVs uh, from whole genome sequencing data with the greatest amount of accuracy. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of different uh, things that we've done. Uh, I won't have time to talk about all of them, but probably the most important aspect of our analysis is having a strong benchmark uh, of CNVs with which to compare the methods to. So the picture on the left, you might recognize uh, that gentleman, that's uh, Craig Venter. He was one of the people who was um, instrumental in the original sequencing of the human genome. And he's also one of the individuals, uh, one of the few individuals in the world whose genome has been sequenced and for which quite a bit of analysis has been done on his genome in terms of actually assembling it instead of just having the reads and mapping them to the reference genome. So his genome is actually quite well characterized. So a, a few years ago, um, some people at uh, TCAG, in collaboration with another group, uh, developed a variant benchmark in Craig Venter's genome uh, that's um, pretty much as comprehensive as any variant benchmark that you'll find uh, for any individual anywhere. So this chart here uh, shows that a number of different methods, so some microarray-based methods and some sequencing-based methods, were used to find uh, CNVs in Craig Venter's genome. And the fact that many different methods were used is one of the primary advantages uh, of this benchmark. So some of the CNV detecting tools, um, when they evaluated uh, their method or compared it to previous methods, uh, they used data from the Thousand Genomes Project. And one part of the Thousand Genomes Project was identifying variants um, in some of the genomes that were sequenced as part of that project. Um, but the difficulty with that data is that this, the same types of technology were used to generate those variants as are actually being evaluated. So it was whole genome sequencing data, and it was read depth based methods, or split read, or paired end mapping based methods. So if you get good concordance between your new method and these, um, this variant benchmark, it's actually not terribly surprising because it was the same types of methods uh, were used to find the variants in both cases. 
Uh, whereas in this case, we have different methods, some based on microarrays, some based on comparison of the assembled sequence. Um, so there's less bias involved in actually evaluating the uh, methods for whole genome sequencing. Okay, so the first thing we did, uh, which is sort of, oops, I went too far, uh, which is sort of the obvious thing to do, uh, is to compare several of the read depth based methods for uh, detecting CNVs from whole genome sequencing data. So we compared six different methods, and it's a little hard to see here. Uh, but basically, uh, we, we separated them into deletions and duplications because they actually have very different accuracy um, for each type of CNV. They actually perform pretty well for deletions, but actually very, very poorly for duplications. So it shows that a lot more work uh, needs to be done in terms of accurately identifying duplications. Uh, but for deletions, uh, we found that an algorithm called ERDS uh, was the best uh, one. It actually has a fairly low false discovery rate and pretty good sensitivity when compared uh, to the benchmark. And the second best algorithm, uh, actually, there were two that were tied. One is CNV Nader, and another one is Genome Strip. Uh, they had accuracy that were uh, pretty close to one another, but we prefer CNV Nader because it's actually a lot easier to set up and use, and it's also a lot faster uh, than Genome Strip. And this actually makes a lot of sense because Genome Strip was uh, initially developed for the purposes of of comparing genetic variance populations. So um, it, it, it sort of is, in that way, it's a little less comparable to the other tools, but it can still be used, uh, it can still be used to find genetic variance um, in individuals. So we did uh, test it, especially because it's quite a popular tool. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if you go back to this uh, chart, uh, the tool that performed the best, uh, ERDS, it was actually one of the least cited uh, methods. So it's here, um, whereas most of the other ones that we evaluated, uh, except for Canvas, which is really new, so it makes sense that it doesn't have a lot of citations, uh, it didn't have that many citations. So this is sort of, uh, you know, it goes to show that you can't always just rely on the popularity or the number of citations of a particular tool for uh, evaluating how accurate it is. And obviously no one's claiming that, you know, the more citations, the more accurate. But often in, uh, in the field of bioinformatics, um, if you don't have any other information, you know, like let's say there's 10 tools for a particular purpose, if you don't have any other information as to which tool is the most accurate, that's what people tend to go with is the number of citations. So, um, you know, it's, it's a reasonable proxy, but um, it, it doesn't always uh, turn out to make sense. Okay, so we looked at uh, the accuracy of the different tools, and then I'm just going to briefly describe one other thing that we looked at, and this was the DNA library preparation method. So we, we tried, so we sequenced uh, the Venter genome four different times. Uh, two, of the, two times we're using uh, PCR3 uh, DNA library preparation methods, and two of the times we're using uh, PCR-based library preparation methods. And what we found is that the ones that were PCR-based resulted in a lot of waviness in the sequencing depth. So the, the sequencing depth wasn't as uniform as with the PCR-free uh, library preparation kit. And you can see this, whereas, like see here, the read depth is fairly smooth. Uh, here it's pretty wavy, so there's some sort of systematic bias in the read depth um, in different regions. And this causes a lot of difficulty uh, with CNV detection algorithms that are based on read depth because they rely on the assumption that the read depth is going to be uniform throughout the genome, or at least like pretty uniform, except for they're actually CNVs. So based on this data, we recommend the use of PCR3 library preparation kits. Okay, so as I said, I only, I only described two of the things that we looked at, so the comparison between the different CNV collars uh, and the DNA library preparation kits, uh, but we looked at a lot of other variables too, and based on our analyses, we came up with this workflow. So this is basically the workflow that we recommend for accurately detecting CNVs from whole genome sequencing data. And I won't go through all the uh, steps because I don't really have time, uh, but this is the workflow that we developed. Um, and using this workflow, uh, so at the very beginning of the presentation, um, I mentioned that missing project, which is genomes from uh, families affected by autism. So we, uh, we looked for CNVs that were potentially pathogenic, so they were overlapping uh, genes, if, if there are deletions that are overlapping genes 
uh, that have been associated with autism. So we found 174 of these in different individuals, and thus far, all of them have validated as real uh, CNV. Uh, 127 of these were validated using microarrays, and 47 uh, using PCR. So, so far, our workflow seems to be working uh, very well. Okay, so um, in conclusion, uh, our workflow, as I just said, seems to work uh, fairly well, which hopefully should enhance our ability uh, to find these CNVs and to um, study the genetic architecture of diseases like autism. And uh, finally, like I mentioned before, uh, a lesson is that the most cited bioinformatic methods are not always the best ones. Okay, so that's it. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, Stephen Scherer, uh, as well as all the other people who've been working on this project. Okay, well, like, is that freely available? Or are you going to publish it? Or uh, we're working on the paper. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. so, but you'll give it out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's good. Any other questions? Well, uh, I'm not sure if you are the right person to ask the question or to answer it. In the autism, you have 90% in the true uh, twins. 90%. What about the other 10%? Is that epigenetic or something? Uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, the other interesting aspect of that data is that um, in this one study at least, 100%, there was 100% concordance in girls and only 85% concordance in boys, um, which was also interesting. Um, so uh, autism has a gender bias, as you might be aware, like four times as many um, boys are affected by autism as girls, so that might have something to do with it, but how? But, but the, the true sequences of the true uh, true twins, the true sequences are identical, 100%. Yes. Makes sense, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean an, another aspect of it might be that autism is a difficult disorder to diagnose, and I mean, there's a lot of variability in whether someone yeah, yeah, is diagnosed with it or not. Problem. So, so, so it, it, it could be just variability in whether someone is diagnosed, and maybe they're somewhere on the spectrum, but they're not officially diagnosed as autism, so that can account for uh, part of that 10% as well. Thank you. You, you have suggested the PCR-free uh, uh, library. How about PCR-based? For example, if I'm doing PCR-based sequencing, uh, so I should do, uh, I should use which tools? Uh, if you're using PCR-based? Yes. Um, actually, that's something that we haven't analyzed yet, but that's actually a really good idea, that if, if you do a PCR-based, like all of the all the tools have corrections for like they incorporate corrections in their model for variations in read depth, but they all do it in different ways. So that's actually a really interesting question as to which ones can handle the way you miss the best. But we actually don't know. And second question about the two winners, like the RDS and the CNV nature, for both deletions and duplications, or um, so ERDS was the best for deletions and duplications. Uh, we didn't pay as much attention to because none of them were very good. Actually, another tool, CNMOS, was actually the best for duplications, uh, but only like a little bit. So um, overall, we would say that um, urban scene but, data were the best. Can you imagine, for example, using one tool for deletion and another tool for Yeah, that could, that could certainly be done. Yeah. So yeah, if, if you were especially interested in duplications, you could try that CNMOS if it, if it had the best performance. Along those lines, is there any like attempt to make like an ensemble of all these methods in order to get a better prediction? Um, yeah, we've actually tried to do that uh, as part of our workflow, and actually didn't actually work that well. Um, they, they, the, the methods actually have low concordance with one another, so we thought that it might work well. But um, the methods we've tried so far, like the voting-based method, haven't, haven't actually worked that well. Have you used uh, a panel of controls? Pardon me? Have you used a panel of normals? Like? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, have you used, yeah, it's difficult to say. Um, so we were comparing whole genome sequencing of samples. But do you have a panel of normal? I mean, perhaps genomes with neutral CMVs? Um. So I'm not sure what you mean by neutral CNVs. Like everything is compared just to the human reference genome. So that's what everything is relative to. Okay. Like when, when we're looking at Craig Venter's genome, mm -hmm. that's what it's being compared to is just the human well, reference genome, compared. which is an ensemble. Is it like you're saying, if you had the reference genome compared to a thousand genome control data, mm -hmm. how would this work? 
زمان چشوه هایی سایی؟ نا مای کوشن ایز دو یه فر ازمپل ایل لیست آف ون نوم جینومز like samples or genome sequencing, which we know for sure, I mean for sure, that they don't have CMDs. Don't have CMDs, yes. Uh, um, I think it's perhaps impossible. Um, Synthetic genomes <laughs> that were made a specific way, and how do they work? And well, 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 that would like, be the way. Well, well most genomes aren't going to have a CMD in a particular location. Mm -hmm. so, so you can visualize that using So what we often do is we, we, look, we use this um, integrative genomics viewer to actually look at the read depth. And like often you can tell you know, just visually whether there's a CMD there or not. So you can, can confirm negatives as well as positives in, in any genome. Like most, most regions are not going to have CMDs. <clears throat> okay, maybe we'll just head over to the next door. Thank both our speakers.